Um, our first speaker is going to be Molly Bahannon. She's counseled children and adults, couples, groups, organizations, and businesses for over 35 years. She founded and directed the Park City's Counseling Center in Dallas from 1982 to 2010, and she served as a director of counseling at the Oakland Community Services in the late 80s, which is where I got to know her. She's a keynote and motivational speaker and writer, combining wit and wisdom to inspire others to live, love, and laugh. God knows we need that. Well, I was just sitting here thinking, I've been on this stage before, but it certainly this room did not look this way. <laughs> and I immediately thought, where's Laurie, where's Laurie, where's Laurie Masters? Because Laurie and I used to do a lot of fundraisers together and, and be on stage together, Mike remembers, so I thought I went, I need her here. Um, I just, I want to I wanna take a moment, I'm one of these people, if I don't say it now, I'll forget, and there's a couple of things I really want to remember to say. And one is, it wasn't in my presentation, but when they were talking about some of the presenters here and some of the things you all are doing, uh, I think one of the things would be important to acknowledge in the history department of, of the gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, so forth, so forth, so forth, and you'll understand why I say that in a minute. I was back in the early 90s was uh, very fortunate and had a wonderful stint at being the president of the Texas Counseling Association. And, and I'm very happy to say over my 25 years of serving on the board of directors of one of the largest counseling associations in the country, we over, I'm thinking now, f five years ago I was asked to go in and help start a new division called the Texas Association for Gay, Lesbian, bisexual, <laughs> transgender issues in counseling, which we lovingly called the alphabet division of our organization, or the sexual one. But it was so cool to watch the, the professional mental health counselors in the state of Texas embrace a very important concept and make it a statewide division to help mental health prof professionals work across the board with those kinds of issues. And that's one of the things over my history of working in the counseling industry as a gay professional, part of the, the history of this city since I came out of graduate school in 1972. So just wanted to acknowledge that that's, that's a very wonderful thing and I hope you all will resource or access uh, those folks that are out there in public schools and mental health counselors helping with those processes. Felicia Porter, which many of you probably know well, was one of my counseling interns. She was my office manager for four or five years and now, of course, specializes in that. And it was a joy to watch her totally evolve and, and be such a big part of a very important and, and challenging uh, role in the world of mental health. So I remember to say that. The next thing I want to do is thank so much the people of Dallas Way. I had no idea this was going on. I sort of disappeared for a while, uh, not purposefully, but I moved to East Texas and I'd work and I'd go back and sort of uh, I wasn't around um, Dallas gay community activities for a long time. So I didn't wonder where it was going on until Ann was kind enough to say, hey, uh, thanks to Facebook and those things that have brought us all together in some ways. And I said, what a cool thing. Next thing I know, I'm up here. So, thank you, and thank Bruce and all of you for the work you're doing for this, and University of North Texas, That's, it's pretty special. And then came that moment of figuring out, and Bruce was so funny, he said, would you send me a 12 to 1500 word stuff? I said, Bruce, I can't possibly do, and even if I send it to you, I probably won't talk about anything I write. So, I'm, I am a speaker, but I tend to come off the cuff, so this is, so bear with me here. But, you know, film whatever you want, keep whatever you want. So I go down, I, mean, I was in Austin this weekend at a counseling event, and, and I was thinking about what I wanted to say, so I, I, I just came from the Mel, Melrose, which I still call the Melrose, and <clears throat> thought through this, and I thought, okay, there's some things I could say, which probably I shouldn't, <laughs> in terms of telling stories, since it's storytelling, and and probably some things that should be told. And the, and I was telling Ann, how do you pick when, you, when you've spent a lifetime just sort of being a gay gal running around Dallas not knowing it was historic? <laughs> and that's why those are those things I won't tell. But 
<laughs> probably people have on their walls somewhere anyway. Um, but it, there were fun times and great times, but I decided the most poignant thing I could do would was look at what would... It, I kind of compared it to over the years as I've transitioned from large houses to small houses to to an apartment to a condo and to a room. Uh, it's not padded yet, but you know. I've, you know when you make those decisions, what do I need to take with me? And what do I want to take with me, but you can't take it all? I, I sort of thought about it that way. What would I think would need to be told, and the other is what I would like to tell you that was important to me personally. So I'm going to try to do both in 15 minutes, or now 10. But <clears throat> So I want to speak first to, I think, the time and the place. Because I happen to come into this community as a working professional at a very serious time. And that was in as, boy, I'm already feeling myself tear up. Now that was not part of the agenda here. But that's also me. Um, I think probably even walking in this building um, and, and remembering every night dancing, and that is one of my loves and still is. And I, I just sort of felt all that when I bought, you almost could see all my friends again, you know, and, and passing by here. <clears throat> but I think a little bit about Oaklawn Community Services needs to be acknowledged here. Um, I was fortunate to be asked, actually, Lori Master sat me down one day and said, would you please come serve on the board of OLCS? At that, and I was running Park City's Counseling Center. I said, well, I'm not going to quit doing what I do, but I know you don't have a director of counseling over there. One had left for a while, and I said, I would like to do that, but I don't know how that will work. I would rather put my skill set into helping the counseling program than in helping a board of directors from which you can pull many, many wonderful people to help. And so I served as director over there for a couple of years, and that was and that was a very, very valuable, important, um, and poignant um, organization in many, many ways. We had the AIDS counseling program that was developed. We developed the drug and alcohol program during those years, and then we never. I was over the general counseling um, program, but to watch in the volunteer program grew. And um, uh, what's the, the little house for the kids with, with Brian's house was created, you know. So, I mean, those were amazing. And the groups of people that came together that make those happen, I, I just wanted to acknowledge. And those were some of the most um, meaningful years for me professionally to help other counselors grow and get into helping people stay mentally well during a very difficult difficult time during physical illnesses. Which leads me to the fun part and the part I want to talk about. My nature is about love and laughter. Always has been. I think staying positive and healthy is how I've worked in my practice. Always teaching positive affirmations. Love yourself, bottom line. Um, I said goodbye to a lot of men who were my clients during those years. Because that was, those were the years that about every week we were going to a funeral of somebody we knew who was no more than 30 years old. And so my role was more, I think, keeping us healthy and positive and, and helping others realize that how we feel about ourselves, our self-esteem truly matters in terms of our health. So... I'll shift to then what happened that made a big difference, and I guess you know it mattered if I have, since 1986. I still care, have this folder and all those moves I've made. And there was this little event we created, along with a lot of volunteers. The women of this community suddenly rose up 
and were the ones that began all the fundraising. Not totally without the guys, don't misunderstand me. But you know how women can organize and get a lot of stuff going. And suddenly we found ourselves doing some really great, amazing fundraising, which has continued, obviously, since this city outshines everybody in that department. But back then it was a new thing. And so one day this gal came to me and, and she said, you want to come audition? We're going to do this thing called the Magic of Peter Pan. And, and I have the script right here that I reread when I was Austin, in Austin. And, and four gals, Jane Vanderventer, Diane Pierce, Diane Bird, well, actually three, wrote this. And, and we decided to do a play to raise money for the AIDS Resource Center. <coughs> And I am telling you guys, I have this button right here, and it says, I survived the magic of Peter Pan that I have had since we'd have our after parties. It was absolutely one of the most joyful, amazing times of my life. And the reason it was wonderful is we all decided we need to laugh, guys. I mean, it was so heavy. You could just, you know, just walk through the neighborhood and it was, ugh. Well, we did a little X-rated Peter Pan which was uh, fun and joyful. We did it out on a ranch one night, spent the whole day, and the masses came. And after we did that one, they said, would you please do this at the Arcadia Theater? And I have, I, I actually have the programs, the Magic of Peter Pan, the Age Program at Oakland Community Services, people on here whose names you would know if I even went, and who are no longer with us, too, that were <laughs> Tinkerbell. That, I played Peter Pan, by the way. I was cast in the role. I was 40 years old. And to this day, that picture of me with the costume, which I still have and wear on Halloween occasionally down here, um, it was magical for me personally, my emotional self, my, but reconnecting to people and together doing something that made a difference in laughing and playing. Sherry Briggs was one of the lost children. Laurie was an Indian, oh, hilarious. You know, and, and it was just, um, I think, our way of, of managing. But from that came some of the most amazing fundraisers that this city has ever seen that just boomed from there. Um, I, and uh, in a minute, uh, I was showing some pictures. Oh my God! I just I said I can't believe I looked like that. Number one, but I did. <laughs> Still am. You see, the part of me that's true is I am always going to be a little boy. So <clears throat> I have this picture of me, and I told my sister. I said, when that day comes, I leave this planet. I've, We've donated our bodies, so I'm, we'll probably do something here and dance. I don't know. But I want that picture up. On, on If they're going to put a picture up, put that one up. Because there's something, and I guess I want to say that to our community, staying magically happy and, and embracing the joy and the magic of who we are is really what works and what matters. But then when we came together as a group of people and weren't alone, and could laugh instead of cry, some really lovely things began to happen. So I really wanted to tell that to you. Um, and we have, the, and the video's out there somewhere. You know, they have the video, the music, everything. And it's still funny, by the way. I remember when the lines was, uh, Sherry would say, we love to play with Peter. <laughs> um, the other thing, the only other thing I want to share with you before I, I close, because people have great stories to share besides absolutely more than me, but but the other is this thing that Laurie and I, again, Laurie came to me, Molly, would you do this thing called the Extra Mile Awards with me? And some of you are nodding, you kind of remember that, and I said, sure, what is it? With Laurie, I kind of said, wait a minute, tell me what it is first. She, I was... <laughs> <laughs> she says, I think we need to start honoring the women of Dallas who've gone the extra mile. Not just in the world of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, but on this planet, in this city. And people, a lot of straight women that, that we acknowledged over those years, and I don't know how many years we did it, 10, 12, and we would give it, we would do this event once a year, and people would nominate people um, you know, people like the folks that started Brian's house, 
and of course from there it grew as we the years passed other people the mayors of Dallas things like that and and I want and so we would get together once a year and stand up and really we would give 10 awards they weren't just little ones and to hear people going oh my god I didn't know those people were doing these things and and to I think my point here is it was a period of time where validation and celebration of life and love and laughter was probably more very important just for us to get up every day and be okay with what was going on here with our brothers and um, I'm just and I have a theater, uh, what is, he didn't say, I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts. I am a former theater major. And it was a way for me to kind of do my thing on stage as well as hopefully help bring a little laughter into people's life. And so Lori probably was the single person for me, and I'm sure many others, but she would just say, come on, let's do this, and we would do it. And when other wonderful women followed who I'm sure have been on the stage. And I've, I've looked at some of the YouTubes and go, oh, my God. So I just want to close. I decided the I was going to bring glitter in here and throw it all over y'all, guys, give you a little magic dust. <laughs> but I couldn't find any on the way from the Melrose to here. So I'm sort of surprised. There should have been some glitter somewhere. <laughs> but I'll never forget. Do you know how long it took me to glitter, uh, get glitter, glitter out of every orifice of my body for at least a month after the magic of Peter Pan? And anyone who's been on stage and get glitter, because I would be throwing magic dust all the time. I had it everywhere, which was interesting with my girlfriends at certain points during the evening. <sighs> Those are the parts that shouldn't be told. <laughs> Okay, I just want to go, at the, the song I sung at the end of The Magic of Peter Pan and the chorus came in, I decided to use this as my closing tonight because I'd like you to take away from tonight, from me, the same message that I tried to do with my, my clients, some of whom were actually the volunteer leaders of the AIDS programs who themselves died, but I had the privilege of walking through their death with them as their counselor. Names aren't important, but you would know them if I told. And I'd sit at their funerals with nobody knowing really who I was, because you're not supposed to know about those things when you're a therapist. But I would know their history. And it was um, a privilege to have walked that journey. So um, the song is called Neverland. Okay, and it goes like this, and no, I'm not going to sing it because I don't think I even remember the tune, but I would if I did. When you close your eyes and start to dream of all you'd like to do, don't despair that your hopes go there, and soon you'll follow too. In, everyone, in everyone's heart, there is a neverland. Wherever land, forever land. Believe in yourself, and you'll see dreams do come true. All you need is you. Thanks so much. <laughs>